morning, everyone. Great to see you today. So glad that we get to be together today. And we're going to jump right in as I welcome you back to week two of our free series. Together, we're on this church-wide journey for six weeks together because we believe that there are places in our lives where God wants to do a new thing, where God wants to help us experience freedom in ways that we have yet to experience. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I hope that you've had a chance to dive into this journey. Uh, Dan and I did this week, and I can tell you personally, I loved it this week. Uh, I opened my guide and took some time to work through that, and as I did, you know, I, I found myself pausing and praying because the truth is I've read it all ahead of time, just so you know. Uh, and, and so, but, but I said, Lord, would you help this to be fresh and new in my life? And you know what I found is that as soon as I did that, the Lord met me in this. In fact, the Lord started making me a little uncomfortable <laughs> because the Lord is answering the prayer in my life to have greater freedom. And the Lord's bringing to the surface, I can already tell, some places where he's inviting me to trust him in new ways and experience new freedom in my life. So uh, I, I did my journal on Monday, and then I got ready on Tuesday for my small group to begin. And after what I had worked on in my journal, I was feeling a little vulnerable uh, as everyone came to our house and we got ready to jump into our group. But you know, right away, as we sat down together and laughed and had a good time and enjoyed one another around the living room, I was reminded I am not alone. <laughs> there are other people, and we all have big things going on, and together we can support and encourage one another and experience the presence of Jesus. I believe that God has some great things in store for all of us, a part of this journey. And I want to encourage you to, to take those three steps to be a part of this. It's not too late if you haven't done that yet. Just the quick reminder, this journey has three components that work together. The first is to be here every Sunday so that we can worship together and open the word together as we look uh, for God to give us new freedom in our lives. The second is to be a part of a small group once a week for six weeks uh, to connect with others and, uh, and uh, enjoy some friendship together along this journey. If you haven't yet signed up for a group, uh, there are groups that still have room and would love to have you. You can sign up right at the bulletin board outside the sanctuary, uh, and we would love to help you connect with a group this week. How many of you were in a group this week, or at least intended to be if it didn't get rescheduled because of uh, the ice? Um, excellent. So you can see a lot of us are doing this, uh, and I want to encourage you not to miss it. And then, of course, uh, your personal guide. This is a journal that will help you through the journey. We still have uh, a lot of copies left, and you can find them at either door, and I encourage you to pick one up if you didn't get one last week. We'd love for you to have this uh, to be a part of the journey. Well, last week when we kicked things off, uh, we talked about the definition of freedom. And we find this right at the beginning of our guide as well. And we're going to see it on the screen. And if you would read it out loud with me, total freedom means living completely fearless, passionately, and joyfully, regardless of your circumstances, not because of them. So last week, as we jumped into this freedom journey, we talked about how, uh, how it's challenging us to think about uh, freedom in ways that might stretch us a little bit. Last week, we talked about how even in our lives, when things are difficult and challenging, when life doesn't feel very free with our circumstances, when, when things aren't aligned the way we wish they were, that even in those moments in life, we can have freedom. Last week, we were inspired by the Apostle Paul as we read his words of joy and freedom that he wrote from a prison cell. And if that's ever an example of what it is to be free, because real freedom is rooted in our souls. Real freedom isn't dependent upon our circumstances. Real freedom is dependent upon our God. Now, throughout this series, we are challenging this notion of freedom. We're stretching our minds to wrap our minds around what it's all about. Now, when we think about freedom, uh, what it is to be truly free, 
We might uh, think about having the absence of restriction or limitation. If I'm totally set free, I don't have anything holding me back or holding me down. To be totally free would be to be uh, independent, would be autonomous. It would mean that I could do whatever I want. There would be no restrictions upon me. But today, I'd like for us to think about something because I think it's uh, ironic. The greatest freedom is not found in the absence of rules, but the presence of the right kind of rule for life. Let me say that again. The greatest freedom is found not in the absence of all rules, but in the presence of the best kind of rule for life. Now, we instinctively know this is true. Let me give you a couple examples of this. Let's think about our nation. The United States of America, our nation that was born out of a dream of freedom, that on July 4th, 1776, the Continental Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence. Our founding fathers were driven by this dream, this dream of liberty, this dream of freedom, to be free from Great Britain. And to quote the declaration, to be free from the injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. But what we found was that this tension between the the current reality that, that these early leaders were experiencing and their dream of freedom was in such tension that it caused them to take action. But I find it fascinating when we think about how all of this unfolded. Do you notice how the Declaration of Independence reads? It talks about how we all have the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness at the core of our existence, at the core of our dream of this country. But then it says that to secure these rights, in order for us to be fully free, in order for us to experience life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, governments are instituted. I'm looking at my government teacher friend back there. Can I get an amen? I don't know where she is in the room. (laughs) Christina's here this morning. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. This vision of these founding fathers, this vision of freedom could not be achieved with the absence of law because freedom is never absolute. See, the absence of any boundary or restraint is just chaos. And the dream that was driving the beginning of this nation was not uh, freedom from all rule or law. It was, a, it was a dream of a particular kind of rule, of a particular kind of law that would give freedom. Because I'll say it again, the greatest freedom is found not in the absence of all rules, but in the presence of the right kind of rule. Here's another example. Let's think about our financial freedom. Now, for most of us, finances can be a stressful thing. We think about the places where we're trying to manage our money, the places in life where there's just a little too much month and not quite enough money to make ends meet. Have you ever been there? I've noticed around the country there's a movement happening. There are people who are determined that they're going to become financially free, that they're done with the pain, the stress, the conflict that it creates in their lives, and they want to experience financial freedom in their lives, to live a different kind of way. There's a course, Dan and I have been a part of it before. It's called Financial Peace University, and it's, a t- it's taught by a guy named Dave Ramsey. Maybe you've heard him on the radio or uh, seen or read articles from him. He's all about financial freedom, about getting out of debt. And part of the fun that he has created is helping people celebrate how joyful it is when they are free, when they are out of of debt. So let's uh, take a look at one of these clips where he's helping someone celebrate what that's like. All right, Victoria, have you been practicing your debt-free scream? Because your mama has paid a price to change your life. All right, you, you ready? All right, Victoria and Stephanie, 
$1,000 paid off. 44 months. Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. Three, two, one. We're debt-free! Wow! I love that so much. Don't you just want to cheer with them? Man, that's incredible. The amount of money that she paid off, $66,000 paid off in 44 months. I'm telling you, that woman got intense about things. That woman followed some crazy rules. And how ironic that is. Because that moment of joyful freedom that they're celebrating, that they get to walk in freedom, their future is is paved in a beautiful way because they are debt-free. It opens all kinds of doors for them. But do you know how they experienced that freedom? Was following a lot of rules, very uh, detailed rules, excuse me, very detailed rules and things that they had to get really, really serious about because they discovered that those boundaries and those intentional things in their lives actually brought freedom. See, it's true about the founding of our country. It's true about our finances. The greatest freedom is found not in the absence of all rules, but in the presence of the right kind of rule for life. So today we're going to take a look at a passage of Scripture where Jesus describes what it is to be really free. And as we do that, uh, we're going to recognize that right from the very beginning, Jesus defined himself as the freedom giver. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 4. This is very early in the ministry of Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 14, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread all throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim, say that word, freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began by saying to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. You see, right from the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, he came in and he wants us to know, just as the prophecy of Isaiah foretold, God is a freedom giver, and Jesus has come to fulfill that, to come as the freedom giver and to set the oppressed free. This is God's intention for us. Today we're going to uh, spend a little more time looking at another story in Scripture where, where Jesus describes himself again as a freedom giver. And in this section of Scripture, if you want to turn there now to John chapter 8, you'll notice that in this section of Scripture there's a lot of conversations, discussions, debates that are happening about who Jesus is, what's his identity, what's his mission, who is this Jesus person, and what is he all about In fact, if you look at those headings in your Bible around that John 8 area, you might see that it uses the word dispute, dispute, dispute. There were a lot of conversations that were happening uh, at this time. So let's take a look at uh, this story in John chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let's pause here for a moment. Jesus is letting them know that that when they choose to follow Jesus, that sets them free. You see, that's what happens when someone becomes a disciple of Jesus. That's the rule for life, that when someone follows Jesus, it brings freedom. 
But even at that time, those who were first listening to Jesus didn't understand this. It didn't make sense to them. Verse 33, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we will be set free? Those people who are listening to Jesus are, are saying, what? wait a minute, what do you mean we aren't free? Maybe it's similar to how we uh, experience that as Americans. When someone says, you need to be free, and you say, wait a minute, we're in the land of the free and the home of the brave. I'm already free. <laughs> Well, Jesus wants them to know uh, that there's something that they don't understand. See, in this conversation uh, with Jesus, these Jewish listeners are, are trying to just brush aside what Jesus is saying to them about freedom. They're, they're saying, well, we already are free because we are children of Abraham. And they're thinking that means that, that they've never been in bondage to anyone which is really kind of an ironic thing because when you look at their history and even at this present moment in time, there they are as political pawns of Rome. And in the past, they've been uh, in bondage to Egypt and in bondage to Babylon. But there's something in their spirit that says, but we, we, we know that our identity is that we're free people. We are the Jewish, the people of God. But Jesus is trying to communicate to them at this moment that, that real freedom runs far deeper than any external or biological ties. Real freedom is a deeply personal and spiritual matter. And Jesus wants them to know, just as he wants us to know, that if they continue to sin, they are slaves. And it doesn't matter who their ancestors are or what their life story is, they're slaves. So Jesus is clarifying for them. He's not talking to them about the role of government or the role of human leaders. He's talking about freedom that has to do with the deepest places in their souls. Jesus continues, verse 34. Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus uses this phrase as he clarifies with these listeners uh, and with us. He says, those who are slaves to sin. We think about those places in our lives that, that draw us in and entice us. Those destructive kinds of places in our lives and in our hearts. These messy places in our inner worlds, the places where anger is unchecked, places where lust has a life of its own, places where suspicion drives us, places where we are judging others, places where jealousy reigns in our hearts, places where there is hatred within us or bitterness that we cannot let go of, places where we loathe ourselves or hate even the creation of ourselves that God made. See, we all have these kinds of places in our lives and in our hearts that are deeply rooted and messy and ugly and places we don't like to think about very much. We find that, that our lives are, are often falling into ruts, places that enslave us, things that happen in our lives, maybe a, a relationship that has become toxic that you find yourself continuing to feed into, but you know that in that relationship it's unhealthy and there's judgment and anger and suspicion, but somehow you keep fueling it and keep allowing it in your life. Or maybe there's a rut for you that's just really hard to get out of. Maybe it's, it's a habit that's running your life. Something that began as a small indulgence because it was something that you deserved, but then you discover that it took on a life of its own, and now has an appetite that has to be fed and is controlling your life. You see, as humans, we all have these things, these messy places in our lives, these ruts that we fall into, these places where we are enslaved to sin, just as Jesus talks about. And these are the very places in our lives that Jesus wants to address 
Jesus wants us to know that there are places in our lives where we must face the fact that we are not yet free. And there is something that God wants to do in our lives and our hearts because that is not what God wants for us. He wants us to experience freedom. If only we will have the courage to face it and to admit that we aren't free, that just as those listeners of Jesus said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Freedom to us, we're free. And Jesus says, but are you really? Because he sees their hearts. And my friends, Jesus says the same thing to us, that if we will really open our hearts and be honest and open before the Lord, I promise you, he will have something to say to each and every one of us. Because here is what we have to know about Jesus. Jesus is relentlessly committed to your freedom. He loves you. He is crazy about you. He is the freedom giver. And he wants you to experience freedom in your life. In those places that are holding you back and weighing you down, that is not what the freedom giver wants for you. Jesus says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So if we have this moment when we say to ourselves, okay, I believe it, I'm facing the fact that I'm not free, and I want to be free, so what do I do? And Jesus says, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So we might look at a statement like that and say, okay, well then, what is the truth? What is this secret knowledge that I have to find? What is this that if only I understand this knowledge or, or get this thing wrapped in, into my brain that, that then I will be free? But you know, that's not it at all. With Jesus, truth is not a what. Truth is a who. Truth is a who. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see, with Jesus, freedom is not about the truth as in some secret knowledge that we have to find and dig for and obtain. The truth is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ, and he is the freedom giver, and he is the one who sets us free. When you know the truth, when you know Jesus, he sets you free. It is the person of Jesus that makes all the difference in the world. You see, at the heart of your freedom is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's all about a relationship. It's all about following Jesus. It's all about following the freedom giver. And it's a relationship with Jesus that sets us free. That's the kind of rule for life where we find freedom. So today I want to ask you a question. What's your connection to the freedom giver? Do you know, you are most free when you are tied to someone who is all about your freedom. You are most free when you are tied to someone who is all about your freedom. So when was the last time that you flew a kite? <laughs> Has it been a while? It's been a while for me. I don't know about you, especially in weather like this. Boy, it sounds really nice to think about the kind of weather where we could fly a kite. Think about a kite. Picture it in your mind as, as you think about a kite way up in the air. What a great picture of freedom that is. Wide open sky and space the ability to soar. There's this joyfulness and playfulness as we watch a kite flying up in the air <clears throat> in freedom. We see a, a kite and we think about the incredible potential that it has, but we know it can't do very much on its own. It's dependent upon the connection that it has to the string and the weight of its tail and the lift of the wind. But let me ask a question is the kite free? Is a kite free? I heard a little parable once about a kite. 
It said that one windy day in March, a man watched a boy flying his kite. And it seemed to the man as he watched that he could almost hear the kite speaking aloud. How wonderful it is to soar into the blue sky. It's thrilling beyond words. But if only that little boy would cut the string that is holding me back, I would soar higher than any kite has ever gone. What an annoying and vexing thing is that string. But poor foolish kite, the man said in his mind, don't you realize that if the string is cut, you will crumple and fall to the ground. The thing that holds you back also holds you up. We've all probably been there or can at least imagine the moment that, that if a kite is flying in the air and the, the string is cut, we imagine the kind of freedom that it will experience and the way that it will blow in the wind and soar high, but not for long, right? It will soon come crashing down to the ground or get caught in a tree, and that will be the end of its flight, you see, by staying connected to that string, we know that, that a kite can go higher and farther than it ever could on its own. It has more freedom. It's free to be its best and to do more than it ever could on its own. And I love this image of a kite as we think about what it is for us as Christ followers to be in relationship with the freedom giver. And we think about what's essential in that connection with the kite, and so it is with us. The kite, notice, is tethered. It's free because it's tethered. That's the very thing we've been discussing today, that the greatest kind of freedom is not found in the absence of all rules, but in the presence of the right kind of rule for life. You see, when we choose to follow Jesus, Jesus tells us to follow him, to surrender everything, to take up our cross and follow him. And you know, at the surface, that doesn't sound very free. But that's the paradox of following Jesus. Because the truth is, you are most free when you are tied to someone who is all about your freedom, just as a kite soars in the air and the one who's flying it is all about the freedom of that kite, so it is our Lord is with us. And because of that, tension is key. Not only tethered, but tension is key. Because that tension provides for even more freedom. Now think about it for a moment. Imagine you're flying a kite and you want that kite to go higher in the air what do you do? You don't just let out a whole bunch of slack real quick. You pull. You create tension on the line. You pull. It, you know, even as we're watching this video and we see the one who's controlling this, this stunt kite here in this video, do you see the tension that he's creating on the line? It's that tension that creates a lift. It's that tension that allows the kite to soar and do those cool tricks and, and be in the air. It's that tension that's the key. And so it is with us. You see, when, when we choose to follow Jesus, when we are tethered to the freedom giver, when we trust him to lead our lives, he creates tension. Boy, I'm telling you, Jesus created some tension for me this week. He brought some things to the surface of my life that's creating tension for me, that's uncomfortable but do you know why? Because he is relentlessly committed to our freedom. He is the freedom giver. And that means that we can trust him. That when we experience something in our lives and in our hearts, something pulling and pushing, when we experience discomfort that the Lord brings in our lives, when we discover that something is not right, something is not free, something is not as it should be, we know that Jesus is doing that because he longs for us to soar into even more freedom. So today, it may be that now you can put the name to something that you've been experiencing in your life and in your heart, some, some tension that's there. 
that doesn't always feel good, and, and it's easier to just say, I, I don't want to worry about that. I, I don't want to think about the tension that I feel regarding that habit in my life or regarding that area of my heart that, that hurts and is messy. But Jesus is saying you, to you today, don't be afraid of the tension, and it's okay to lean into that and to trust that the freedom giver uses that tension for your good. Or it may be today that, that you want to think about your connection, your tether to the freedom giver. To say, I don't know that I am very connected or I've never connected my life to Jesus. Today is the day where Jesus invites you to experience what it's like to connect your life to a freedom giver. Right now, today, to simply give your life to Jesus. That's all it takes. Today we have some time to respond. Uh, we have a couple of songs ahead. And during those songs, I want to invite everybody to come on forward. And I want you to come to one of these baskets here and pick up a piece of kite string. And it's just a reminder for us that, that we stay tethered to the freedom giver. And that this freedom giver creates tension in our lives. And that's a good freedom giving thing. So take a piece of this kite string, and then you can put it in your guide and use it as a bookmark throughout the journey, just a, a small reminder for you of the way that he is the freedom giver in your life. And I hope this will be a moment for you to pause and to invite God and to trust him to do whatever he wants to do today and in the days ahead. Will you stand and pray with me? Our gracious God, God, we're so grateful for the way that you love us. God, the truth is we are in awe that you are a God who sits on high on your throne and you look to us and want to give us freedom. Wow, God, you're so kind and so generous and so good. And God, I pray today that for each one of us in this room that you would give us the courage to trust you to know that, that you have good in mind for us and that you want us to experience abundant life to the full. And so, God, I pray for us as we pick up a piece of kite string today, Lord, that you would help us to stay connected to you and to invite you to create that good tension in our lives as you give us freedom. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And it's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our freedom giver, that we pray. Amen.